Welcome to the Practice Brave Podcast. I am the host, Brianna Battles, founder of Pregnancy and Postpartum Athleticism and CEO of Everyday Battles. I'm a career strength and conditioning coach, entrepreneur, mom of two wild little boys, and a lifelong athlete. I believe that athleticism does not end when motherhood begins, and this podcast is dedicated to coaching you by providing meaningful conversations, insights, and interview topics related to fitness, mindset, parenting, and of course, all the nuances of pregnancy and postpartum. From expert interviews to engaging conversations and reflections, this podcast is your trustworthy, relatable resource for learning how to practice brave through every season in your life. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Practice Brave podcast. Today I am here with Caitlin Martin. She is a black belt in jujitsu and she recently had her second baby. And we connected on Instagram. You might follow her. She is Mommy Grappler on Instagram. I started creeping on you a while ago because I just love that you were sharing a little bit about your pregnancy and doing jujitsu. And I know yeah. that, that is very much a growing realm of our jujitsu population of women participating in jujitsu, moms participating in jujitsu, and people navigating pregnancy and postpartum during those seasons. So I love that we connected. Thank you so much for coming on today. No, thank you for having me. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Like how long have you been doing jujitsu? What were you doing before jujitsu? Just give me, give me a little bit of a rundown. Yeah. So I have been doing Brazilian jujitsu for 17 years. Um, I started when I was about 20 years old. And prior to that, I was actually a college cheerleader and cheered at a small division two university in Indiana. And before that, I was a um, competitive swimmer and diver in elementary through high school. So yeah, I've kind of always done sports, but Brazilian jiu-jitsu has been where I tended to shine the most when it came to athleticism. I love that. I <laughs> love that you found jiu-jitsu at such a young age, especially as a woman. I feel like that is still, yeah. like you're still part of like a rare, a rare breed out there. <laughs> Yeah, there weren't too many um, women when I started. Um, I had a total of one female teammate when I started Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and she was a blue belt and an absolute beast and beat me up all the time. Um, but it was super hard back then to find other women that did Jiu-Jitsu. And it's so funny. It seems like it in some places, there's a lot of women in the gym. And then in other places, there are none or just like a like a handful. And it, I don't it, it's just been interesting to observe that when I've been in yeah. like four years now and just seeing the different dynamics. And we're always, at least where I've been, I'm always a uh, one or maybe like four girls <laughs> in class, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's growing and it's been growing steadily. Um, it definitely depends on like number one, the area and number two, kind of the culture within like the gym itself. But it's definitely a lot bigger than what it used to be. And it's kind of awesome to be able to see that. Yeah. I was going to ask you, like, what's it been like to see that growth? What do you think is like helped, especially for women doing it? So um, I got to experience like massive growth because of the fact that I started in Indiana, which didn't have much Brazilian jujitsu at the time. Um, and like I said, there was one other woman that did jujitsu at the gym that I started at. Um, and that's where I got my purple belt. Um, I was there for quite a while. Uh, and then just kind of slowly it growing over the years. And then like the evolution of like women's grappling network on Facebook going from like, you know, a couple hundred of us to thousands of women who do grappling, talking about everything on there. And then um, the team that I'm on now, we have probably over 20 women that do jujitsu between our three classes or between our classes. Cause we have morning classes, noon classes, and then evening classes. And obviously we're not all there at the same time, but it's massive compared to what it used to be. And it's really nice to have that kind of like community and see that it's not just, you know, the, the young girls that are doing it to try and be athletes, but like most of like my teammates are moms yeah. also, or like in their thirties and yes, we're competing and training hard and having a fun time, but 
again, like it's not just, it's not just the like young athletes or just the self-defense. It's a whole variety of women that do it now compared to before. Yeah. Sorry. I, I love seeing that part. No, it's okay. She's nursing her little baby right now. Um, yeah. I love, I, I, that's the same in the gym that I'm at. It's the majority of women that are doing it are moms and started yeah. after they became moms. So it's been really cool to see that. But at 20 years old, like what made you go from <laughs> Like I can, I actually can <laughs> see the parallels between cheerleading and diving. I can actually see how that translates yes. to jiu-jitsu, um, with it yes. being really dynamic and stuff like that. But yeah. what you say, you know what? I'd like to fight people. <laughs> so, that's funny. Um, like that's like some really serious insight on yourself and your athletic development and where you spend your time. Like that's, I think it's awesome. Yeah. So um, I was actually uh, a survivor of sexual assault my senior year of high school and um, went into counseling through like my school counselor and my senior year of high school and then also my freshman year of college. And uh, this was at a time where PTSD was only kind of given to service members who saw war Mm -hmm. and they were just kind of looking at the mental health aspect of PTSD in other areas. And so they were like, well, you have the symptoms of PTSD, but didn't fit the criteria because of the event that happened to me. Um, And so I worked with a couple of really great counselors and then they were like, well, you should do something to kind of get your, um, like, feel empowered and do something that like kind of gives you that like, gives you the power back in case something ever happens again. And so... Uh, a friend was like, oh, check out this thing called Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And I walked in and um, both my brothers wrestled and my dad wrestled and did Judo. So when I saw Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I was like, oh, this looks like stuff I have seen and this doesn't seem scary. And so that's what ended up like having me try out Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was that it looked like things I had grown up seeing the impact my entire life. And so it made it very, very easy to kind of at least get on the mat and start trying it um, because of that. So, yeah, I went in looking for some form of self-defense and empowerment and tried out a class. And that was just kind of it. Yeah. So look, I thank <laughs> you for sharing that. I know that's like a really sensitive and mm-hmm. hard, but also powerful topic for other yeah. women who have had a variety of experiences across that spectrum of domestic violence, sexual assault, all of these really complicated and triggering topics. So thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to, like, it's one of those things where lots of therapy um, and self-worth made it so I can talk about it with, and more of a factual type thing and not like a, oh my gosh type situation, but 17 years does that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Amazing what can be accomplished over that time period and like the yeah. growth and what jujitsu does for our mental health and empowerment and confidence. And I tell everyone, like, I don't have a daughter, but if I had daughters, jujitsu, like both of my little boys are in jujitsu, but especially yeah. if I had a daughter, like, I feel like it is yeah. a critical life skill, not even a sport, Absolutely. like a life skill for little girls to know, because it could literally save their life someday. And like, I think Absolutely. about like being in college and how many or just traveling alone for work so often, just how I wish I would have had jujitsu earlier, not necessarily like, oh, cause I've had to defend myself, but knowing that I could, or had that skill set and like having that kind of confidence when so many girls experience insecurities and really vulnerable situations, whether we, you know, for a variety of circumstances. Yeah. So if your mom of a little girl, take it from us. <laughs> It's a good good life skill to instill in both your little girls and your little boys. Um, It's really powerful. So you started to or started to get to at twenty, and like, what was your moment where you were like, "Yeah, like I really like this. This isn't just trying it out. It's not just a hobby." Like I like you like drink the Kool Aid and go all in. For me, it happened at Blue Belt, but like I don't know. Every everyone kind of experiences it differently. Yeah. So my my Kool Aid moment was. Because it, it is, it's kind there of, is. Um, my Kool-Aid moment was I didn't tell my instructor that I wanted to try a jiu-jitsu tournament 
And um, I'm, like I said, I'm from Indiana. And in the Midwest, the biggest tournament at the time, which is still a huge tournament to this day, is the Arnold Classic. Mm -hmm. Um, To the point where, like, I think Grappling Industries is in charge of it now. But, like, Cyborg Abreu shows up and does the absolute or the expert no-gi division in Columbus, Ohio at the Arnold's. So, like, every single year that you go, like, there's like random world champions or like UFC champions that are like, yeah, I'm going to go compete at this tournament in the middle of like in the Midwest. Yeah. And um, it's always been this massive tournament. And so like, I was like, ah, there's a local tournament. That's like three hours away. Local tournament. (laughs) I mean, back then that's a local tournament. (laughs) That was a local tournament. Three hours is super close. So, um, I went to it and about five minutes before my first match, I was like, I don't know how to do a takedown. Um, And I was dating a guy who was a wrestler at the time. And he like showed me how to do a single leg. And I grabbed a collar and a sleeve and I shook the girl and she fell down. And (laughs) that was my first takedown ever. (laughs) It was amazing. It was Top tier white belt technique to yeah. shake somebody until they fall. <laughs> um, and I ended up getting third place in the division. Um, and like I said, there was like three months of jujitsu in there. And I won two of my matches. And I don't know how I did it. Um, I'm still moderately confused as to how I did so well. But I, like afterwards, I was like, oh, I like this. Like I can fight people and like they give me medals and yeah. this feels pretty awesome. And so like I went and did it and I went back and I told my dad who again did judo and wrestled his entire <laughs> life. And he's like, we're gonna fix your takedowns so you can, <laughs> you know, not do that again. Um but it just became this like super addicting thing. And then like I would bring jujitsu stuff home and my dad would like show me like judo and wrestling things or my brothers would show me wrestling things that I could incorporate in. And it just became like this weird little thing that I did with my brothers that I didn't get to do before because there was no wrestling back then for girls. Yeah, So I it became that. this fun thing. And yeah, I really There's ended so up in power it. in it becoming like a part of a family like a family dynamic like that it's a very like bonding experience in a aggressive but playful way you know (laughs) oh yeah and like one of my best experiences was I think my second or third tournament my instructor wasn't there yet but my dad was there and so he's like sitting on the edge of the mat saying random judo terms (laughs) and I would like stop and stare at him because I didn't know what he was saying and then he would like explain it in English and I was like he was kind of coaching me through this tournament when he had never done Brazilian jiu-jitsu but he had judo and wrestling and so he was like I'm gonna figure it out and I'm gonna help her out and so he was like giving me like tips and oh hold here or make this grip or go to this position or try I think you called it an arm bar try that thing from mount and so he was trying really hard to help out as much as he it was great um (laughs) and it was one of those like core memories where I was like this is really fun having my dad here for this so yeah that's so special and like so empowering at like yes 20 but like still at such a like a precious age you know yeah. and our like development and coming into what it means to be like an independent woman like still having that support from your dad and your family especially oh, yeah. in a sport that is so male dominated especially back then oh yeah it was yeah it was pretty male dominated back then it's yeah. still pretty male dominated but back then yeah. it was like oh this is this is a lot of dudes <laughs> yeah a lot, a lot of dudes went. so you got into competing like right off the bat Yes. Yeah. Yes. And it hasn't stopped, um, right? Or it hasn't. It was there so <laughs> there was actually, um, I had a break at Purple Belt um, after I had my son. So before I had my son, I had actually herniated two discs in my back and was rehabbing my back at the time and found out I was pregnant. And because I had been gone for so long, I chose to hold off on coming back to jujitsu. And I ended up being out of jujitsu for about three and a half years at that point. So I was a purple belt for seven years. I don't recommend. Um, <laughs> That's when it was like a blue but, belt technically for like 10 years. So 
I feel like I feel like these it's so important. I want to like dive into that a little bit because so many people that is so common in the like in the lifetime of being a jujitsu athlete, like of seasons of just being removed for whatever reason, like choice, circumstance. Yeah, it was it was a hard time. And like I I genuinely missed Brazilian jiu-jitsu at that point. Um, didn't actually think I was ever gonna get back into jujitsu when it happened. Um and that was that was pretty hard, but ended up getting back into it. Yeah. We found a way to get back into it and I got back into it. And the year that I got back into it, I ended up with my brown belt and competing again. So rewind like what kept you out like obviously you said you got you had your your son at purple belt your first yeah and then was Um, it just like mom life and like just hard hard to juggle all of that because I know there's a lot of people that you know have babies and feel like their time competing or participating in sport is like over so talk to me a little bit about that yeah I um I didn't have the support that I needed um so I was married previously and um like my husband now is a brown belt you know so he lets me like he loves jujitsu just as much as I do and is addicted so there's never a question of am I going to be back on the mats the answer is I'm going to be back on the mats um but with my son um I was married to somebody else who did not have the same passion for the sport or was any interest in the sport as it was and so um he was in the military and at three months old, we PCS'd from Washington State to North Carolina. And he was not comfortable with me continuing to train. And I said, okay, for three and a half years and blew up to 178 pounds. And I'm only five foot two. So that was not a good look for me. And, um, was miserable. And finally, one day I was like, I can't do this anymore. I miss jujitsu and got back into Brazilian jujitsu by doing open mat on, it's called Fort Liberty now. Fort Bragg uh, had a combative school where they had open mats Monday through Friday at noon and showed up one day and they said, yeah, we've got open mat. Yeah, you can do it. And that's how I got back into it. And just kind of said, you know, I've got to do this for my mental health and my health and chose to do it. And that's so brave that you were able to like take back that part of yourself despite not having the support. Yeah, it um, it was not easy. And uh, it was a kind of catalyst situation where I was like, oh, I need to do this and I need to kind of find what makes me happy again. And so it was kind of the beginning of a domino effect, which ended up with me, you know, in Virginia now where I am and uh, remarried. But yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Jiu-Jitsu like just mm-hmm. truly helps people take back their life at all. Yeah. Different for all different reasons. Like that's something that seems to be a, a common thread for all of us, whether that's at the initial reason we start or that's something along our journey where it's the thing my husband just got his black belt and something he said each was um like on my worst days I want to do jujitsu and on my best days I want to do jujitsu because it is like this steady force of like meditation but also camaraderie with your humans and an environment where like you can only be focused on what you're doing in that moment you know it's just absolutely I love that you're able to take back your life and trust that respect <laughs> with you like being a catalyst. Like that's so powerful for people to, to hear. Cause I think so many of us have, you know, different seasons for different reasons where you lose a little bit of yourself and being able to take that back is that's really powerful. Yeah. So, and it's, uh, it's not something that I'll ever give up again. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> but it was a, long slow process and ended up for the better yeah. it's still hard but even like like your husband says even on my worst day I still want to do jujitsu yeah. so yes I I hear you there so a lot of people especially that I've talked to that are 
pregnant right now, or they've been injured and basically they've been off the mat for a while. And they're like, Mm -hmm. should I give back my blue belt? Should I like take stripes off because I've been out of the game for a while? What do you say to people that have been out of the game for whatever their reason is, and they feel like they're not worthy of coming back at the rank that they bowed out at? Um, I'd say absolutely not. You earned that belt and you keep that belt. And I know when I got back into it, I was like, I am not a purple belt with three stripes. I'm not, there's no way I am horrible. And like, God love the guys that I was training with at the combative school, because I would be in a position and I would just give it up. And they're like, why did you give up that position? I'm like, cause I forget. I yeah. forget what to do from here. And they would literally put me back in the position. You're like, what was the goal? And then they would help talk me through the technique that I forgot halfway through. Yeah. And so like they were literally sitting there fixing it and going back to it. And, you know, them doing that, I was able to pick up and catch on more and quickly to the things that I had forgotten over time. But you know, you might not be that belt when you restart. But if you're honest with the the instructor, like, yeah, I got this belt in X year and I haven't been training for X amount of time. They're going to go, okay, well, we're not going to promote you anytime soon, but we're going to help you get back to that position. Or, and we're going to help you get back to where you feel like you are that belt. And then we are going to help you progress past that. Um, And that's what I had. That's what they did for me. And yeah, like I said, I had three and a half years off and ended up getting my brown. Like I started back up in like January or February of that year. And then November of that year, I got my, I was promoted to brown. And I didn't ever expect to like compete again or get promoted. I was just excited to be back on the mat. And so when I got promoted, I just, I cried so hard. (laughs) Because <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I made it. <laughs> it is. It's so. such it's such a powerful feeling because I, I think I shared this because I recently got my purple belt. And you know, yeah. I feel like there's just few there are so few opportunities when you become a grown-up where you are rewarded yeah. for putting in the work. So much of what yeah. we do is thankless or it's for our work or it's for our household. It's for our kids. It's to try to keep ourselves like baseline healthy. What I love about jujitsu is there's like a constant measurement of progress and like reward and people that are bought into you. And like, you're talking about the guys who like helped you work through the mental blocks of like, what do I do next? Like, like the jujitsu brothers that I have are like, they're my, my, godsends like they they have like saved me so many times in so many ways like of being my own worst enemy and I think that it's just so powerful to experience that kind of nurturing and where people are invested in you as an adult because we lose that most of us lose that when we stop playing sports as teenagers or maybe in college that goes away but jiu-jitsu is one of the few sports you can do throughout your lifetime where you don't lose Mm -hmm. that part yeah. It's so yep. And it's, I honestly love it. And that's part of why, like, I've stayed in it for so long is that knowing that, like, number one, we, we need rewards sometimes. And that's okay to be, to need that, like, outward locus of, like, reward and all that stuff. Because some people can do, are great with internal, but, like, yeah, you know, your job is your job. You get paid money. Okay. Congratulations. You that's, that's your reward for doing your job or like my, I've got a nine-year-old he's survived another year. Great. Great. Fantastic. Yeah. It's like that delayed gratification that I think is so important for us to like instill in our kids. And then yeah. also like for ourselves being, mm-hmm shown like jujitsu humbles you every single day. You're never like on cloud nine all the time. Like right when you have something awesome happen, you get humbled like the next minute. And so that's why I think it's so great that, you know, there, your growth is a, it's a measurable process for you over time. And it's not a quick fix. Like most people, the shortest time period typically to get a black belt is what, like 10 ish years. Yeah. Like if you are on a linear path, which most of us are not really on a linear path, <laughs> um, despite <laughs> what our intentions are. Reality is always a little bit different. 
So yeah. it's, uh, I don't know. I just think that's such a, a positive um, aspect that isn't necessarily talked about as much. Yeah. So you just navigated your second pregnancy yes. as a black belt. And you, yes. sorry, so I guess I, before we get into this, like you competed at Brown Belt and you've competed a lot of black belts. So you had like a full competition season, right? Like the last few years. Oh yeah. Um, so I competed quite a bit at Brown Belt and then decently at Black Belt. Brown Belt, I compete, I've competed a lot more at Brown Belt just because I was kind of able to, and that was the pre-COVID times, um, <laughs> which I feel like that is a big statement, like pre-COVID yes. times and post-COVID times, like it's getting true. back into competing after COVID and every all the shutdowns um, was a little bit slower. And I got my Black Belt literally February of 2020. Mm. So, <laughs> so awesome. the first year of like, there, yeah. were, there were no tournaments my first yeah. year of Black Belt in Jiu-Jitsu because <laughs> of COVID. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I got second place at Masters Worlds in Brown Belt, my first year at Brown Belt. Um, Nogi Worlds, I got third place at Brown Belt. American Nationals, I got first place at Brown Belt. And then pandemic times happened. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, after I also um, had a back surgery in March of 2020 because I herniated a disc so badly that it was my only option. Um, but post-surgery and post-COVID, I got third place in 2022 at Masters Worlds at Black Belt. And then PANS of this year, while I was six weeks pregnant, I got second place. So, so yes. <laughs> you are a baller, my friends. And for those of you who may be <laughs> those are some big girl tournaments to compete in, very high level. Um, I went to my first Masters Worlds this past year. And like, I had an, I, like my thought, you know, of what it was going to be like. And then I got, yeah. like, oh shit, this is, this is so different than what I thought. Like you just realize, like I am such a little fish. I am the tiniest of fish here, and like all of these badasses are like, like yeah. people that are amazing are losing, and then like all this crazy stuff happens around you. It was just such a great yeah. um, shift on what competing at that level is like. So it's amazing that you were able to compete at such a high level and perform so well. It's really cool, especially it's like nice. as a mom. You know, I think that was the cool part yeah. of the worlds. There is like you see people over thirty that are yeah. athletes that take this yeah. very, very seriously. That's another thing that yeah. I think just isn't common, but it's common in our bubble, which is nice. Yes. <laughs> so you competed at Black Belt when you were six weeks pregnant. So tell me about that experience. Yeah. So um, my symptoms of my period and my pregnancy are almost identical. And I was really worried about making weight. So I was kind of constantly taking pregnancy tests. Mm -hmm. um, so last year, 2022, I got married to my brown belt husband at Masters Worlds um, after competing. <laughs> But a jujitsu like love story. I love it. <laughs> because why not? Um, yeah, we we eloped in a little wedding chapel, more or less eloped in a little wedding chapel in Vegas because why not? Um, right after world championships. Um, it was a great time. It was a lot of fun, but we had kind of made the decision because we are. I'm not going to say old. We are older. Um, I'm master's two division now. And so he's 36. I'm now 37. And I was like, look, I don't want to be 40 and pregnant. That sounds like it's going to be really hard on my body. Um, so we have until, you know, X date to get pregnant if we want to have a kid. And so we had been trying and nothing had been happening. And I was like, I'm going insane. I want to compete. Uh, do you mind if I do pans? And he was like, no get ready for pants, like 110%. Let's make this happen. And then I started having like pregnancy slash period symptoms two weeks before pants. And I was like, crap, I need to make weight. Um, all right. And my period wasn't starting. And so I started taking pregnancy tests and they were negative, negative, negative. And then all of a sudden there was this little faint line the week before. And I was like, oh, 
shit. Um, <laughs> this this could be bad. And um, I've been making weight when you're just like bloated and swollen and hormonal. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, oh, this this could be really bad. And so I like, call one of my teammates or text one of my teammates who is a black belt and she was finishing her residency as a doctor. And I was like, theoretically, if I make this decision, is it a poor decision? And she was like, realistically, with how many negatives you've just had, um, you're very early on in the pregnancy. You can make that decision safely either way on what you want to do. And I was like, you want to know what I'm going to do it. It's fine. Um, And so I, the next week I was like, all right, I'm good. And then all of a sudden, like I had morning sickness and I did not have morning sickness with my son. Um, and so weight was not going to be a problem because I couldn't keep food down. (laughs) That was a little bit silver linings of that situation. (laughs) Silver linings. Um, and so my whole goal was like, I was like, all right, I got the buy. So as long as I win one match, I get at like, I get into finals and I can, I can survive from there right? Like I can survive if I just at least win one match. And so I win my first match and I'm like, I feel decent. And then um, my opponent for finals is a woman named Mary Holmes. And um, I actually know her really well. She lives like three hours away, two hours away from me, not very far. Um, And she and I have had a super fight before where it was a great match. And I was like, all right, cool, Mary, I know what she likes to do. Like, this won't be horrible. And she and I high five this bump and we go and just the fact that I had no calories in my system hit and I just like survived and did not get submitted. And I was very happy with that. Um, And then afterwards, Mary was like, are you okay? Cause like, you seemed a little bit, she was like, no offense, but you seemed a little bit weak. I was like, yeah. um, So I'm pregnant. And I just found out. And she was like, Oh, And I told her, I was like, yeah, I've got morning sickness. And so I've not been able to keep any food down. And Mary is a physician's assistant. And so she gave me a list of medicines that I could take over the counter to help with my morning sickness. I love that. I oh love my goodness! The women that compete in jujitsu that like you just like become good friends like away from it. Yeah, and it was so funny because like my team found out like literally. As we were going down there, I was like, hey, guys, so, you know, I'm pregnant and uh, I'm going to compete and we'll see how it goes. And so they were like on top of everything and like watching me like a hawk and just panicked. And I was like, no, I'll be fine. You know, um, I was going to do this cute little announcement for my husband, um, but he had seen me messaging the doctor the black belt doctor dress. And he was like, oh, what are you messaging her about? I was like, oh, nothing. Um, and then he was like, you've never said, oh, nothing before. And I was like, no, don't worry about it. So I had to like, tell him at jujitsu practice in like the back hallway. (laughs) I was like, I was going to surprise you. I know. I was like, I wanted to do like this cute announcement for him. And he was, (laughs) nope. He was just like, you don't hide things from me. And I was like, I don't hide things from you. So now I'm going to tell you the truth instead. (laughs) And so it ended up being just kind of funny how it all happened. And then um, the picture of me holding the positive test at Pan Am's was super funny because the girls who give out the medals, Uh um, they saw me kind of like messing around with stuff and then they saw it and like they screamed and like, because they're, I think every single one of them is Brazilian. They're like, we will take the pictures for you. Don't worry about it. Oh my gosh. And like, they're like posing me and like taking pictures for me. And I was just like, thank you. And so like a whole bunch of people found out that I was pregnant that weren't going to find out that I was pregnant until like way later because like they were so excited. And I was like, oh, this is really fun. This is kind of a cool way to like let people know, I guess. That's really cool. You've had yeah. like such an awesome like jujitsu like love story, but all of the <laughs> like with the, like your husband, with like your dad and your brothers, and now like I know yeah. your kids, and I see that on social media. It's just so awesome that like that's been such an integral part of like your jujitsu journey and sharing yeah. like, these big life moments and stuff in that environment. 
Yeah. And I mean, it's, it kind of just happened where it ended up being like, oh, I met my husband at a jujitsu, like the guy who became my husband at a jujitsu tournament. And then like, kind of just evolved from there. And like, my son who's nine isn't as into jujitsu right now, but he still does it for like the exercise aspect of it and the social aspect of it. But him going to tournaments, he loves doing tournaments with us and all that stuff. And at least going and doing the like the experience of going and like, you know, they snuck him into like at Masters Worlds where the black belts sit to coach. They snuck him in so he could sit down and like be able to see me compete from the front and all that stuff. Awesome. And like, yeah, it's just kind of been this, it's the definite background noise to like everything else going on in life is like, yeah, it's happening, but it's all happening on the mats too. Not cool. I think that's been such a special part of like our family dynamic too, is like so involved in it. And like, it's just normal. Like how awesome is it that we both have little boys that are nine and minus (laughs) that like them seeing mommy, like roll around and fight like men is just like normal. Like that is a normal expectation for them. Like that's not weird. I just think that's such an empowering way for little boys, especially to grow up and seeing that with their moms and, and dad in that environment too, and doing stuff that is like continual self-development. It's just been, it's it's really just added an element that I never fully grasped before, you know? Yeah. That's awesome. Do you think that being like watching your son when he competes, is that harder for you than competing or coaching yourself? Like, how do you feel about that? So he hasn't competed in a while. For him, it's just fun and social right now. Mm -hmm. Um, However, near the end of him competing and stuff like that, I was like, all right, do you want me to coach you or do you want somebody else to coach you? And he'd be like, I don't want you to coach me. I'd be like, that's fine. And so I would like stand next to whoever was coaching him and record it. And like, I've seen so many parents because I've refereed too for a really long time where like they have these insane expectations of young children and (laughs) like the things that come out of parents' mouths sometimes when their kids are competing just like have horrified me. And so like for me, I'm like, buddy, I love you. I'm so proud of you. You're doing amazing. I'm so excited. And like, I'm like screaming just encouragement the entire time. And like, if you lost, they'd be like, yeah, you lost. It happens. It's not a big deal. Um, And then just kind of like, it's all right. You have more matches. Or like, there's one time where he had been like sick the week before. And then he's like, no, I still want to do the tournament. I was like, all right, let's do the tournament. He did his first match. He goes, yeah, I can't do the rest of this. I was like, okay, great. I'm going to scratch you from the rest of the tournament. Like, we're not pushing this. Like, it's a lot easier for me to just kind of like, be mom and like record and Mm -hmm. yell happy things at him. And if I don't coach him, he does so much better. So I'm happy to let literally whoever he says, no, I want this coach to coach me or I want um, his stepdad is wrong. I want Rob to coach me, not you. And I'm like, that's totally fine. (laughs) Please somebody else coach you so I can just sit and yell. Um, I might yell at a referee if they aren't giving points (laughs) to my kid. But other than that, like, I'm just like, no, you're doing wonderful, honey. I love you so much. Mommy's so proud. (laughs) I feel like if you have been a coach, a referee, an athlete, it's so much easier for us to like know how to control ourselves on the sideline. Yeah. Always the people that like, you know, living vicariously through their kids that like lose their shit and drives me nuts. So like, I just have like immense anxiety. I sit there and like, I just, I try to film, but I am like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> like I just, I, I have so much like performance anxiety, just watching yeah. it's worse than coaching or competing myself. Like I have gone <laughs> my whole life being in this kind of, kind of arena of competitions and like nothing for me has ever compared yeah. to having to sit there as a parent and like watch and then like just be supportive without like any yeah. toxic behavior. Cause I will not. I don't participate in that. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you, like you said, like seeing it all, especially with roughing, it is really disturbing because mm-hmm. it is kind of like an alpha environment. So you get a lot of intense personalities, 
in uh in one room and you know i think yeah. the goal is to like keep kids interested in participating in the sport and not like yeah. for them and i know that can get ruined pretty easily in those environments for kids yeah it definitely can Okay, so let's actually talk about your pregnancy. Now that we have all of this backstory, you got pregnant, you did that, you found out at your competition or right around there. And then what did training through your pregnancy look like? And this is recent. Your baby is what, a couple weeks old? Yeah, he is three weeks old right now. <laughs> yes, yes. Like, she's adorable. She's so freaking cute. So what did that, what did jujitsu look like for you or your overall like just yeah. routine like for you during this pregnancy? Yeah. So, um, like I said, the first couple of weeks I was competing, training like competition mode, um, because I was getting ready for Pan Ams, which means really hard training. Um, and it was, I was extra tired, but kind of just chalked it up to it being competition mode time. Um, after the tournament, I was like, all right, I'm not going to train that hard for a while. Um, and so I started to back off, um, my first OB appointment, the very first OB that I saw at like the place that I was going has like eight different OBs and they're all women. And the very first one I saw was like, you can't do this anymore at all until after, you know, you've had your baby and da, da, da. And I was like, that's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to continue to train. I'm just going to modify as I need to. And she was kind of upset about that and so I ended up seeing literally everybody else in the practice other than that one OB and they were all fairly supportive of it they're like look you've been doing it x amount of years you should be able to figure it out what is and isn't safe and so um I got really picky with training partners um no offense to new people but unless they were tiny white belts that I could control like 110 percent I did not roll with white belts um and then I started focusing on mostly training with some of the other women um obviously my husband was always a training partner and then there were some of the we have a decent amount of black belts so I trained with the other black belts or um a couple of the guys who were very much flow rolly and giant but also very aware of how big of humans they were yeah and like purples and brown belts so they were like oh no I can easily do this and so my team was super duper supportive of it the first trimester I trained pretty normally as long as I wasn't having morning sickness (laughs) because I had a lot of nausea the first trimester um and then At the end of the first trimester, I cut out all uh, takedowns just because I didn't really want to risk takedowns um, and hard landings. And then um, second trimester, as the belly grew, you know, neon belly, no more. Um, Mount was okay until like as my belly got bigger, I took more things away just because it wasn't feasible to like have somebody sit on my stomach in mount. (laughs) <laughs> now could they do back mount on me absolutely and I can still practice escaping and that type of thing um but as it the belly got bigger things kind of cut down and I just kind of kept going um and then around September a little bit before September everybody was getting ready for master's worlds so I took a big back seat and only like helped with coaching or like slow drills with like newer people and things like that to make sure that the people that were competing had quality rounds every single round because I didn't want to be in their way while they're getting ready for a tournament um and then up until 35 ish weeks I at least drilled um and then unfortunately I got gestational hypertension and it started causing major blood pressure issues and I had to get sidelined until baby girl arrived. Yeah. How was that for you? That was horrible. Um, (laughs) Not being able to even like drill and like it got to the point where like I was still trying to dress out and like help instruct like somebody was teaching and I was helping like fix people in the background by 36 weeks. I couldn't even do that. My hands were swelling. My face was swelling. My feet were swelling. And I could feel when my 
pressure was spiking. And so it became one of those like, all right, I'm done teaching kiddos. I need to go home so I don't sit here and try and do more than I should be doing. And that was, that was rough. So, yeah. Yeah. Can be really hard when that's like such a huge part of like your routine and like yeah. how you spend your like mental energy, your physical energy, the environment you're used to being in. And yeah, just being sidelined like that is again, for a million different reasons across our jujitsu journey is yeah. so <laughs> frustrating. <laughs> But I mean, my teammate, teammates were great. My husband was great about it. Like um, he did not train as much either because he was like, well, I want to be there with you. And he, I think he felt bad. And so he was just like, misery loves company. We'll just hang out together. Um, and then my teammates were like messaging me and contacting me pretty constantly. Um, and then I taught kids class until about or at least showed up to help with kids class until about 37 38 weeks and then handed over the reins to the uh assistants and the people who were helping cover until I get back type thing so that's awesome and then is that not too horrible yeah and then you had your baby like what, like right around like the 40 week mark, I feel like, cause we were talking like about yeah. the podcast and then the webinar or the workshop that I hosted thing. Yeah. I'm, like, I'm going to have my baby like tomorrow. I'm like, we <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I got induced at 39 weeks okay. um, because they weren't going to let me go past 39 with her, um, with the issues with the hypertension and everything. They wanted to prevent preeclampsia. So I got induced at two o'clock in the morning at 39 and one <laughs> and she was born November 8th. So, awesome. yeah. And how was your birth? How are you feeling? It, it was, it was okay. Um, my first came without needing to be induced. Um, she had to be induced and uh, there was like, I'll admit that there was part of it that was kind of traumatic and it wasn't anything that they did wrong. It was that, um, my body responded too effectively to the medication. Mm -hmm. And so once they broke my water and everything, I dilated the final five centimeters in less than 30 minutes. And my epidural couldn't keep up with the pain that I was feeling because of how fast everything progressed. And so I kind of panicked because that was a lot more pain than I was expecting to feel. And uh, my team was wonderful. My husband was an absolute star and was sitting there like reminding me how to do deep breathing exercises to keep my heart rate low and make it easier to breathe through everything. And I would recommend my husband as a doula to anybody because um, <laughs> he was just phenomenal. Um, but yeah, it was it went so fast, the final part of it, that it was a little bit traumatic. Um, and, but afterwards, I was like, all right, well, I survived. And I'm not going to do that again. So we're good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> good when you like, your nose nose kind of no. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, well, I'm glad she's here. Yeah, I'm not doing that again. Yeah. So, yeah. That's awesome. And so you are about three-ish weeks postpartum now. Yeah. How's your body feeling after delivery? And it's like, you're, I mean, you are in the trenches right now. She seems very chill and sweet since I know you were just nursing her not that long ago. Like, yeah, she's, she's <laughs> just knocked out. Just knocked out. I love that. Um, but how are you feeling? Like this postpartum, like you're still in the trenches. Yeah. Even if she seems like a chill baby. Like you're still probably not sleeping great and your boobs are different and your body's different <laughs> and life is different. Everything is different. So how yeah. you doing? So I'm, I'm doing decently. Um, it was, they got us out of their like lesson, I think at like the 36 hour mark, mm -hmm. um, after I had her, uh, like I had her at, at 7 38 PM. We spent a day in the hospital and the next morning they, they sent us home. They're like, you're doing great. How do you feel about going home? I was like 110%. Please send me home. Yeah, I want to be in my own bed. <laughs> like I want to sleep in my own bed. That sounds like a great option. Um, 
And so we had a couple of little like hiccups the first week. Um, she and I don't have the same blood type at all. And so there was a little bit of blood contamination. So we had some jaundice and um, because everything progressed so fast, the amniotic fluid didn't get moved through her system properly. And so she projectile vomited amniotic fluid everywhere. And so it made it so she lost a little bit extra weight than she would have normally lost. Um, so we had to do a couple of extra weight checks. And then of course they had to make sure that my blood pressure went down. So I had an extra doctor's appointment. Um, but after the first week with like those extra little appointments, it's been decent. Breastfeeding is going well. Nursing is going well. She's got, she gained, regained all of her weight without too much of an issue. The hormone changes, I'm still feeling a little bit of like random hot flashes and stuff that happen when you have a kid. My master's degree is in social work. And so I'm pretty in tune with like the mental health side of things. And I work with new moms a lot. So I've kind of briefed my husband on what postpartum depression looks like and what to look out for. Um, but we haven't had too many issues. Like there's random like, oh my God, I'm crying. But kind of the normal postpartum crying of like, she's just so beautiful. Or, you know, she's had a couple of fits where she just gets upset and cries nonstop. And I'm like, oh. We're gonna we're gonna go take a bath because mommy doesn't know what else to do at the moment. And yeah. so there's been a couple of those little things, but there's not been anything too crazy. And so it's gone really well. And yeah. Good. It really has. And uh I feel like my body is recovering better than it did with my son. But again, I kind of knew what to expect. And so I'm not pushing it like I did as much with him. Yeah. Yeah. And I know you are you've entered the gym again yes. and um, <laughs> kind of exploring that a little bit how's your body feeling moving around oh my gosh I feel so weak <laughs> so I did um warm-ups with the fundamentals class twice so far once last week once this week and it was okay and then um I also drilled some with my husband on Monday and it was guard passing, which top of guard passing feels great. Bottom of guard passing. Nope, not at all. Yeah. Um, regarding or keeping guard at the moment is not easy. And he was going super light and I know that. And, but I was still like, oh yeah, no, those like my hips, my legs, they're definitely, and my core are definitely looser and uh, that's going to take time. Yeah. which I'm aware, but it like, I just started laughing at one point. I was like, oh my gosh, everything's so weak. It's fine. And exactly. he was like, are you in pain? I'm like, no, I just, everything's so weak. Like a different kind of like vulnerability. Like your tissues just are like, they're literally injured right now. Your muscles yeah. are stretched, like your hormones, not great. So like, there's yeah. so much about, uh, dynamic movement and you know like even just trying to like get your brain to like function and connect to what your body needs to do like that is just yeah. that that takes a little bit of rewiring and time and, yeah you know and like just healing your abs your pelvic floor like all of that is just a it is a process it is a journey yes. yeah and it's going to be slow and like laughing about it helps because yeah. like I'm just like, yeah, you know, I didn't do this the last time. So obviously it's going to feel weird, but yeah. it's kind of just, again, it's slow. It's with people that I trust. Obviously my husband's not going to let me get hurt because um, he doesn't like seeing me in pain, but he's going to be the person that kind of slowly does most everything with me without any issue. And uh, he's like, are you okay? And double checking and checking in and he was even like hey you're going too hard I'm like oh okay I'll slow down so he's helping keep me in check and everything and I really appreciate that yeah, so that he's able to nurture and guide you a little bit like that right now yeah. it's, it is hard it's like hard to like reel in the athlete brain and like again like jujitsu there's so much FOMO attached to it like that's like self-inflicted yeah. FOMO you know <laughs> so um it is like such a hard season to be approaching it differently, both pregnancy yeah. and postpartum. So hard to approach it differently. And, you know, because it's so dynamic and, um, 
just like a lot of pressure involved, a lot of tension involved, and just that dynamic hip movement, all of that. When we think about like yeah. pregnant and postpartum body, like what the state of it is, it's like it, it's a little contradictory sometimes. Like our body just yeah. can't do that, um, get really limited, especially in certain positions. So something like guard, any kind of guard game is gonna take a long time to come back. And like I'm just managing yeah. expectations around that you can't really drill it a whole lot during pregnancy and then postpartum nope. it's like just, it's all <laughs> disconnected and so dynamic like that's like the last piece of like athleticism that comes back yeah. and be able to be like really explosive and dynamic and coordinated so I know it's it's hard but it's that I mean I'm glad that we're starting to have that conversation around like approaching yeah these seasons and it's, it's very like, like today I went and did like body weight workouts at the gym, like while well, nobody was there, but you know, I've got mat space and I can do body weight workout and feel okay. And I brought the baby carrier. So when she got fussy, I threw her in the baby carrier and finished out some of this stuff, but it was just like, all right, I know I can't do, I'm not supposed to do more than 10 pounds until I get cleared from the doctor, which is totally fine. Um, but I can throw her in a baby carrier and I can do air squats or I can do like modified dips where I'm like seated dips and like doing that type of thing with her on my chest. And again, these little things that aren't so horrible or aren't so bad, but still make me like sweat and get my heart rate up a little bit. And I feel good because I've spent a little bit of energy and yeah. Yeah. I love that. You're reminding me, I should just send you my my postpartum program. I have like an eight week postpartum oh, program. I need to like send that to you. So then you have some structure for your like gym, your gym workouts. And that can help like you. So you can start that like literally today. Um, I'll have <laughs> side note on the podcast. I'll have a team send that on over to you. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> Cause, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause I mean, it's all like, I mean, you know, as an athlete, you've competed at a high level, like having the, um, I try to tell everybody like having like a baseline of fitness, will only improve your jujitsu. Like that will help you like mitigate injuries. It will keep you strong. And just like, again, like rebuilding some of this connection that gets lost um, when yeah. there's time away when it looks different. Absolutely. And I will use it because I have yes. plenty of time left before I have to go back to work. There, so. you <laughs> there you go. What advice do you have twofold? What advice do you have for women that are like, I've thought about jujitsu, maybe my kids do it, but like I am intimidated to start what would you tell that population yeah so the ones that are like watching their kids do it and are kind of interested but aren't sure I would say like two options number one see if your school does because more and more schools are doing this where they have like a kids and parents day where like the parents train with their kids yeah. and that gives the parents kind of an idea of what their kids are doing in class and gives them some of that like actual one -on like number one it's fun because you're doing it with your kid but number two you're understanding how hard your kid is working and so if you're interested in it ask if your school does that and if not be like hey maybe this might be a fun way to let some of us parents try it out um and see if maybe the school will organize something where you can do kids and parents class we've done it and the parents love it every single time it's it's a huge class because the parents have so much fun with it or the other thing ask like talk to some of the girls or women that already do jujitsu in the adult class and if there's somebody that you kind of connect with and jive with be like hey I'd like to try it when are you going to be in next so I can maybe try it and know somebody in class because half the problem or half the issue that like I I feel like it is is that like no offense to the men but the men they're sweaty <laughs> Yes. And, it's, yes. <laughs> and it's a very very close contact and I've met more women who are like I would do it if I did not have to have a man that I don't know sweat on me yeah. like fantastic like make friends with one of the other like women that possibly do it and like ask Slightly some questions <laughs> like, like 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 make a friend who sweats yeah. a little bit less or doesn't stink as much when they sweat. Um, so because... funny. That was a barrier for me. I was like, I don't want like, you guys are freaking gross. You're so sweaty. But then like, it's an odd thing that you get used to, you know, like yeah. someone asked me about that. They're like, I just can't get over that. I'm like, I know. But like, also, I swear, I don't know when it happens or how it happens. You just, 
it's like weird radical acceptance, you know, like we just, this is just part of it. You don't, you don't, you get unfazed by it over time, unless they like sweat into your mouth and you're always continually phased by that. You will always be. Yes. <laughs> it's only happened twice to me in 17 years. Yeah. And I never trained with either one of those people again. I was like, you're just too sweaty. Like if you weren't sweating through your ghee into my mouth, I yeah. this is too much. This is too much. And we've officially <laughs> turned everybody off to jujitsu with that comment. That was my <laughs> Try no, jujitsu, so, not so. <laughs> you said only two times ever in 17 yeah. years, which is, that's a pretty good, that's pretty good uh, statistic right there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was just like, I just won't overly sweaty people. I do not have to roll with you. I can always just say no. Um, but yeah, that would be my suggestion. Find find a friend or convince a friend to try it out with you because that's always fun. Yeah, so I, really, I had to depend on a friend of ours and I just was like, be my partner. And he was so much bigger than me. You know, like he's probably like 200 and 30, 40 pounds, and like I'm five two, and also, and yeah. I'm, but like, please be my training partner because I know I at least feel safe with you, and I'm not like an inconvenience yeah. to you. Because I think for yes. me, that was like I was intimidated to start because I didn't want to be this buzzkill girl and like an inconvenience to all of these people that were like trying to come in and get a good workout. Um, yeah. But then, like, you just we get over that narrative quickly. Yep. I think once you're in there, like that's a strong narrative initially, but then it it fades out because you realize like that's teaching and helping yeah. each other is like, that's all part of the process and the growth for us. Yeah. And then the second um, question, what advice would you give somebody who does jujitsu or MMA, honestly, like any kind of combat yeah. sport and they are pregnant and they're like having a identity crisis because so much is now changing and adapting and not sure what their future is going to look like or their training looks like. What would you say? Yeah. I would say, you know, number one, keep your medical team uh, abreast of what you're doing and what exactly your sport looks like. I showed my OB's videos of me doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and both competition and what skills and techniques look like. So they had an idea of what competition versus practice actually looked like. So they felt much more confident and comfortable with what I was doing on an everyday basis. Um, and that was a huge help because they, again, trusted me a lot more when I was talking about some of the stuff that I was doing. Um, they thought it was great. So keep your medical team, whether it's OBs, midwives, whoever that you need to be seeing, whoever you were seeing, keep them aware of it. If you've got a you know, the American, wait, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. ACOG. Um, so, <laughs> ACOG. They say, you know, if you've been doing it at least six months, continue to please do it. Modify as needed, but keep the activity and the exercise up as much as humanly possible. And as you get further and further into it, realize that, yeah, you have to do less but you can modify. Maybe, you know, if you're doing MMA and you're not able to live spar anymore, you're still allowed to do like pad work because you're still allowed to punch. You're still allowed to kick the pads because the pads aren't hitting you back. Um, or maybe you're doing a little bit more of like the drilling for the grappling, or maybe you're doing like warm-up drills and dummy drills and stuff like that on instead because it's a safer option and you're able to do that kind of stuff. Um, modify as needed and realize that if you're continuing to work out and exercise to the best of your ability through your pregnancy, you're going to lose a lot less than if you were to just stop and give it all up and not do it. Yeah, um, like an all or something, you know, like, and we don't have yeah. to be, I think we get so focused on um, limitations and I have to be like really careful yeah. when I, like in my workshop that I had, that was for like jujitsu during pregnancy and postpartum, I was like, I cannot focus on the limitations. Like we got to really focus on like, what are the options? Like, how do we stay in the game? Even if the game yeah. looks different during this season, like the point is staying in the game and being adaptable with it. And not just like, do this, don't do that. Like it can't be rigid because this is not a rigid sport and being athletic is not rigid and like pregnancy is so it's new. Not rigid. So yeah, like we just got to find some wiggle room and I appreciate you yeah. saying that. Yeah, just modify right. to the best <laughs> of your ability and like get into the Women's Grappling Network and on Facebook in the group uh, if you're not a part of it and just put pregnant and jujitsu. 
Mm -hmm. because the amount of times it shows up and women giving their advice on what they did while pregnant with jujitsu, like there's so much good advice already there. You just got to kind of like talk to people and ask and look at what other people have done and modify as long as it's a normal pregnancy. And I always caveat this as long as it is a normal uneventful pregnancy. Some people might have high risk pregnancies and they cannot. And so if they cannot, because it's high risk, they cannot. And that is completely understandable. Find different ways. Come and sit on the edge of the mat and watch class because half of us doing jujitsu are there for the community as well. So come in whenever possible and sit on the edge of the mat, dress out, take notes, practice what you can, if you can type thing. Um, but enjoy your time there. Uh, helping the, teaching kids class was a huge help for me. Um, I got sidelined from refereeing because they didn't want me on the mats roughing matches. So they had me as the gi checker or something else to continue to still be there and be a part of it, but in a different capacity type thing. Yeah. So there are ways to kind of make sure that you're part of the community, stay a part of it. Yeah. And so, and so powerful. Cause that's like, I think that's really the fear. Like it's not, I think like the ability is like what masks the underlying like fear of like, I'm losing yeah. my routine and my people and my environment. And like all of these things are like my yeah. participation in that. And so while participation might look different, like we don't have to like lose it during these seasons. And exactly. you're right. I have learned so much from coaching the kids class. It's like, I need it delivered like talk to me like I am an eight-year-old because that is maybe <laughs> how I'm gonna understand jujitsu. So like yes. I think there's a ton of value in coaching and helping out in those classes. Um no matter where you're at in your journey, there's so much to learn just by like I feel like we filter it through a different brain when you're like, okay, the professor said this and now I have to translate to this to a seven year old. So okay, I really gotta pay attention. It like forces you to like filter it differently than how it is like when I'm like la la land zoned out during my own class unfortunately absolutely <laughs> absolutely oh no like <laughs> anytime one's like hey, i want to improve my jujitsu and like maybe dabble in coaching i'm like you should try kids class uh -huh. and they're like well, i'm like because it will number one test your patience but number mm -hmm. two explaining how to shrimp to a five-year-old is a practice in understanding your body and mechanics that you have yes. never experienced in your life no kidding no kidding <laughs> So funny. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much for sharing your Absolutely. wisdom and your time and perspective today. I know that like, honestly, I do feel like this is, while there's many women that have come before me, certainly, and, you know, have come up with you in the sport and have so much advice to offer around being a woman yeah. training jiu-jitsu and being a mom training jiu-jitsu and doing it during pregnancy and postpartum, I also feel like we're on a brink of like really expanding the conversation and thank you for being Absolutely. part of that effort. I, I love it. And um, if you're listening to this and you want to check out the workshop that I did a few weeks ago, it's called Jiu-Jitsu During Pregnancy and Postpartum or something like that. Like really just nice and direct, you know, um, it'll be yeah. like in the show notes. But Caitlin, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. And thank you for having me. I absolutely enjoyed this. Yeah, and if you don't follow her already, it is at mommy grappler on Instagram. Anywhere else people should get a hold of you? Is that where you're mostly hanging out at? Um, I do have TikTok. Uh it's not as as popular. Um or I'm not as popular on there just because I haven't figured out TikTok and how it works. Because we are elder millennials, it's fine. <laughs> It's literally that. It's fine. Um, We're in acceptance. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm mostly on um, Instagram. Occasionally, I'll show up on like the Reddit threads um, talking about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and all that stuff as well. But um, it's mostly Instagram and TikTok at this point. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you so much for being here and for sharing. And uh, thank you. talk soon. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practice Brave podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a review and help us spread the work we are doing to improve the overall information and messaging in the fitness industry and beyond. Now, if you are pregnant and you are looking for a trustworthy exercise program to follow, I have you covered. The Pregnant Athlete Training Program is a well-rounded program for pregnancy with workouts for each week that are appropriate for your changing body. That's 36 weeks of workouts, 
three to four workouts each week and tons of guidance on exercise strategy. We also have an at-home version of that program. If you are postpartum and you're looking for an exercise program to follow, the eight-week postpartum athlete training program would be a really great way to help bridge the gap between rehab and the fitness you actually want to do. From there, we have the Practice Brave Fitness Program, which is an ongoing strength and conditioning program where you get new workouts each week and have a lot of guidance from myself and my co-coach, Heather Osby. This is the only way that I'm really offering ongoing coaching at this point in time. If you have ever considered becoming a certified pregnancy and postpartum athleticism coach, I would love to have you join us. Pregnancy and Postpartum Athleticism is a self-paced online certification course that will up-level your coaching skills and help connect the dots between pelvic health and long-term athletic performance, especially during pregnancy and postpartum. Become who you needed and become who your online and local community needs by becoming a certified pregnancy and postpartum athleticism coach. Thank you again for listening to the Practice Brave podcast. I appreciate you and please help me continue spreading this messaging, this information, and this work. Mm -hmm.